Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with David Mindell, who is here at UC Berkeley with the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, which is part of the um, uh, Department of Integrative Biology. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you, like, what the heck is at the museum? <laughs> you got you got like humans in a, in a box somewhere. Uh, like, what, what what exactly does one see at the museum? But you're also the, the author of this this wonderful book, which is called uh, The Network of Life, A New View of Evolution. Welcome, David. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I think a lot of us have a, a rough familiarity with the, the basics of biology. Um, not even even people who aren't biologists. We've all learned about Darwin, Darwinian evolution, and we all understand, I think, the three basic tenets of Darwinian evolution, right, which are variety, selection, and, and inheritance, right, or fidelity. And, uh, and I think we also have a sense of, you know, genetics and how, you know, Mendelian genetics works. But... I think the existing model that most people carry around is sort of, I don't know, frozen <laughs> in the you know nineteen seventies uh, maybe. I mean, kind of kind of Richard Dawkins level, right? When he came out with his his book on the selfish gene, that's kind of where most of my peers sit. But we've had an amazing amount of um, discovery in the world of biology and genetics in the last couple of decades, and of course. Some people are familiar with things like epigenetics, and a lot of people are familiar with uh, you know, symbiosis and, and coevolution. And, and I think what, what you're trying to do is to take a lot of these new uh, discoveries in biology and kind of package them in the form of a new mental model or a new framework, or as you, you call it, a new narrative. And this narrative is about horizontal evolution in addition to what we might think of as vertical evolution. And so the sort of phylogenic tree that we all know and love, right, with the infinite splits, it, it actually is a lot more complicated. <laughs> and there's dashed lines and, and, and you know, mergers and, and all this other kind of stuff. And, and the more I read about what you were describing, the, the more it seemed to me that biology was starting to uh, kind of resemble the kind of network science that social scientists are, are familiar with. You know, we at social science, we're always borrowing from Darwinian evolution, but then we always make this distinction and say, well, you know, it's there's other stuff. And now it seems like biology is also uh, recognizing this this other stuff. Um, so I guess the first place to start is like, how, how important is it that people need to have some overarching narrative to, to make sense of, of new discoveries? Okay. Yeah, I think it is quite important for people to have a a sense of an overarching narrative. And the way I've approached this in the book is to try and update the narrative for evolutionary biology, because in some ways it hasn't really changed, especially in the minds of the public for a long time. And the, the conventional view of evolution, you know, the, the quick overview, the narrative that most people would have is that there's an evolutionary tree um, which is representative of a series of bifurcations where one group of organisms become two, those two become four, become eight, become 16, and so on, until you've got millions of different species populating the canopy of the tree of life. And um, that's not wrong. It's just insufficient because with a network, it includes the tree and all those branches and all those splits, but it also includes reticulations, which are connections among the branches. So this is horizontal evolution. The reticulation is, is horizontal. Um, and there, the more we've been learning over the last decades, say, you know, three to five decades, it's just how rich, how, how uh, reticulated the network of life really is. And in the case of evolutionary biology, the reticulations are represented by horizontal movement of uh, genetic materials. <clears throat> um, so as I, as I mentioned in the book, there's, there's four main mechanisms by which this goes on. I think here at the start, I'll just mention them quickly. The first is hybridization among species. Um, and most people 
have an understanding of what hybridization is. Um, you know, if you get a, a, a horse and a donkey crossing, you've got a hybrid and a mule. Often the hybrids are not fertile, but often they are. Uh, and they can back cross and they'll have a evolutionary history of, they own, of their own. And often the hybridization events aren't between, say, closest taxa. They could be amongst cousins as well if there aren't real barriers to interbreeding. So one mechanism is hybridization among species. Another is horizontal gene transfer. <clears throat> and that can be a single gene, a piece of a gene, a set of genes um, that are already honed for a particular function that can be transferred between taxa. And horizontal gene transfer is usually amongst microbial life forms, but we're learning more and more about how it does occasionally happen um, in animals and in plants and between those two groups uh, and bacteria and, of course, in fungi as well. Um, so those are two mechanisms. A third would be endosymbiosis, which you mentioned symbiosis early on. And endosymbiosis is just when two species kind of merge. And often, you know, this might be a case where a predator swallows a prey organism. Um, and this would be happening amongst single-celled organisms, like a, a large predatorial bacterium might swallow a smaller one. And the smaller one finds a way to make a living inside the bigger one, just the way we have bacteria living within us. And over time, if, if uh, that happens often enough and there's variation, whatever that um, bacteria that's been swallowed, the swallow E does, that can perform a real function for the swallower, the predator. So endosymbiosis doesn't happen frequently, but it has happened, you know, uh, it has happened multiple times in the past and has given rise to chloroplasts in plants and mitochondria in both in plants and animals, as well as fungi. So they're very important. They're low frequency events, but they can be very important. And the fourth mechanism is just coevolution, And we can talk about that a bit later as we go on. But all four of those, we've discovered a lot. Biologists have discovered a lot in the last 30 to 50 years that is not incorporated in the narrative. And to me, I think narrative is so important because especially for the public, because um, we we understand stories. We're kind of wired to understand a story. And when you get the outlines of a story, <clears throat> you get a lot more information than just, you know, the basics of the story. You get new information and you can plug it into the story as well. So having um, having a narrative that is squared with our best science is valuable um, because it, it it informs our understanding of evolutionary biology overall. And just mention really quickly that, of course, scientists use narrative just like people in movies and fiction writers uh, use narrative as well. It just with scientific narratives, something like the Big Bang, the Big Bang or continental drift or just understanding um, weather patterns. Um, these are all sort of integral to how we understand things, and they tend to be boiled down, these narratives, and often use metaphor. Now, look, some of those types of horizontal evolution that you describe would not be completely unfamiliar even to, to Darwin, right? I mean, Darwin talked about hybridization, right? He talked about, you know, mules and, and, and jennies, right? I mean, he, he understood that there was some of this, this going on. Um, but some of the other stuff, like, you know, horizontal gene transfer among bacteria. I mean, this would have, I think, really surprised Darwin, right? I mean, this this was something which was, uh, you know, really kind of goes right to the heart of the the standard Darwinian model, right? Sure. Yeah. Darwin Darwin published in uh, 1859 uh, on the origin of species, and at that time, people didn't know that. DNA was the material of inheritance until the mid 1940s. So Darwin had no idea of genetics. He he couldn't. The the tools just weren't available. Um, he made some speculative guesses about how inheritance happened, um, but they were pretty wild, and he admitted that they were speculative. And so these are just things that he couldn't have known about. Um, and I make the point in the book that everything I talk about in terms of horizontal evolution fits within the Darwinian framework. There, there's nothing there that 
Um, Darwin sure would be fascinated and surprised by the many instances of horizontal evolution and just the big consequences that they have for organisms. But it's um, it's nothing that he he that that would be outside the worldview of descent with modification um, that Darwin talked about. We just have um, heritability not only from immediate parents, but also from other organisms, some of which may be distantly related, particularly amongst microbes. Um, so it, it fits within uh, the Darwinian paradigm overall, but it, it very much expands it. it. It expands the richness of how we understand heritability to have worked. Right. But I think the way most people think about your, your DNA is that, you know, you're born with a, a blueprint and that every cell in your body has that same blueprint. And there might be some mutations along the way that could, you know, lead to cancer and so forth, but that any of the variation that happens is a result of, of mutation and not encountering sort of other, you know, uh, other organisms. And, and yet this idea of horizontal gene transfer, this is really quite common among bacteria, right? So it seems like the older you go and the more primitive the, the form of life you're talking about, the, the more significant or the more important this type of, of evolution is, right? Yeah, I think that's that's correct. Um, it's just uh, horizontal gene transfer, for example, is just much more common amongst single-celled organisms, and the main groups are, you know, bacteria and archaea, um, and it's quite common there. And what's interesting is that this is a way to accelerate innovation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so this is one of the reasons why bacteria are so successful. And you can note they're successful just by noting the tremendous number of different species that exist and their ability to make a living in virtually all the environments on planet Earth. So, so capacity for horizontal gene transfer um, feeds innovation. And this is what I think is kind of novel as a, um, a way to understand evolution of life overall, all of biological diversity, is that Horizontal evolution um, happens, you know, across all organisms. It's more common in some than in others, but it is a way for rapid innovation. And um, so you get ev evolutionary change can be episodic in its tempo and its mode. So it's not just, you know, in, in vertebrates, things tend to be more gradual and you have small numbers of mutations occurring over time just as single base pair substitutions. Um, but on occasion, and particularly in microbial life forms, you'll have a horizontal gene transfer event, which can bring in a whole new set of functions. And this is what plasmids do as they're um, traded amongst bacteria. You can suddenly have a population that becomes resistant to some particular pesticide or resistant to an antibiotic. Because um, once something has a benefit like that, it can very quickly be selected for uh, and then passed on to subsequent generations. Right. So the idea and this is in social sciences, you know, we think about this all the time, right? So when people tried to apply Darwinian models to the evolution of, of routines and, and know-how, the idea would be that, you know, organizations that were doing things the old way would, you know, go bankrupt. And, and the, the ones, the new ones that had developed some new technique, right, some mutation, they would flourish, thrive, maybe have spinoffs, expand and grow. But in reality, the the older companies take a look at the newer companies right? and they say, oh, well, that looks pretty cool. And then they sort of copy the the routines of of the successful ones. And, and that means that, you know, you you, you see a, a much faster diffusion of you know, right. good routines and good techniques. Right. So that's right. that's that's where the innovation analogy really uh, really kicked in and made sense for me. Yeah, and if you're talking about businesses per se, where where a big company buys up a smaller one, and yeah. um, you know, <laughs> that's the other example. yeah, so they just and, buy and symbiosis, it. right? Yeah, and they maintain the staff and they maintain you know their work facilities right where they are. They've just changed ownership, and they suddenly have all this new capability. So there certainly are parallels with uh, you know between evolutionary biology in a in a and its networking um, functions as what you see in the business world. 
when there are mergers and acquisitions. And what I think that even, you know, biologists could learn from uh, looking at um, sort of the history of economics is just uh, the, the power of decentralization. I talk in the book about inheritance when you're talking about horizontal evolution can be decentralized. This is a powerful, a powerful concept because there, there's both pros and cons of decentralization, but one of the advantages of it is that it's rapid change, rapid innovation. And this certainly can be advantageous for organisms, particularly when they're in a changeable environment, to suddenly get a new set of genes that have already been honed for millions of years in some other organism. Um, you know, if you can manage, if an organism can, you know, if those can be expressed and they are potentially useful, that's a way to get much faster adaptation than single base pair substitutions, which is what you usually see between parents and progeny. Well, I guess the part the part I don't understand, though, is if we look at the organizations that are, say, imitating the successful organizations, you know, they have some kind of discrimination function. Like, they don't imitate the bad features, right? They don't imitate the unsuccessful ones. They imitate the successful ones. So, I mean, if there's just constant gene swapping going on, then this could just as easily lead to the diffusion of sort of, you know, bad genes, right? So, sure. So yeah. how, how, is, how does the, the math work so that the, the, the good genes are the ones that are, are copied, right? I mean, if there's, you need, there's, a, there's an optimal amount of fidelity in the system. That's right. If that's too high or too low, then you ultimately lead to extinction, right? So how do we figure out what the First of all, the level of, of imitation is, or the level of transfer, and then, you know, what's the filtration mechanism for making sure that you only kind of imitate, or you're more likely to imitate the good stuff and not the bad stuff? Right. Well, that's the big question for people managing mergers and acquisitions. The, the way nature handles it is um, might be inhumane, but it's just failure or success. And often, you know, most mutations are deleterious. They're they're non they're not adaptive. Some are neutral. They can be tolerated because they're neither beneficial nor deleterious, but it's a small, a relatively small set. They're going to be advantageous. And so it's really, uh, um, in many ways, trial and error. And that's why having a certain, you know, level of uh, mutation over time can be a good thing because, um, you know, it may come in handy at some point. But it will often, if it's not useful, it'll just be selected against and it won't be um, carried on in subsequent generations. So if the environment is stable for a long period of time, do you then see sort of a, a, a reduction in the mutation rate and a reduction in the amount of horizontal gene transfer? I'd say the, the mutation rate's probably more or less the same. Uh, it's just that um, less of it is, is fixed. Uh, you know, less, less of it is carried on because the environment is relatively stable. Um, so these are just trends. But if for organisms that live in a highly variable environment, having um, uh, a significant incidence of mutation events can be beneficial. I mean, this is how a lot of viruses make their living. Because when they're hopping among host species, that means they've got to get into uh, cells of a different species of host uh, and that's a total, that's a different environment. That's going to be a different kind of immune system to have to reckon with. And so having, you know, a high level of mutation amongst your progeny, if you're a virus and there are occasional jumps into a new species, that's beneficial. And so, you know, we've seen that with uh, coronavirus, just as an example, that there's a lot of recombination, which is analogous to hybridization amongst vertebrate species, recombination amongst microbes. That's when you really, you know, are mixing the, the genomes of um, two different lineages, just as you would with hybridization. So it's a, it's a very powerful technique for coming up with ways to survive in, in a new environment. And in the case of um, certain viruses, the environment is um, the host's um, cellular systems and the immune system that's there. So now, isn't that just another word for, uh, you know, bacterial sex in a yeah, way? It's right? been used. Yes. 
yeah, recombination is, we call it bacterial sex. Yes. Yeah. And so I think you said that of all, all the major transformations in, in biology, right, there's, there are these sort of step functions where we went from less sophisticated to more sophisticated types of, of life. Each one of these needs to be explained by some kind of horizontal evolution. Is that, is, how, how is that the case? Right. Not always explained by horizontal evolution, but it you know, wouldn't be surprising if there's some involved. Um, but, you know, when, when there are <clears throat> big changes, you know, in the, the morphology of organisms, um, it, it'd be nice that, you know, we try to figure out how that happened. And sometimes you, you can find particular genes that are involved in a new phenotype, a new morphology, a new appearance. Uh, a new physical body of the organism, and we can, you know, get an idea what happened. And in some cases, it's just, you know, slow uh, vertical evolution over long enough periods of time where it's just, you know, parents to progeny. Those progeny become parents and they have progeny. Other times, there's um, some sort of horizontal evolution going on. And um, that has been, you know, in, when we talk about Organisms like us, we would call eukaryotes, organism with a true nucleus. So these are multicellular organisms. We found that the endosymbiotic events that gave rise to chloroplasts and mitochondria, um, you know, tremendously consequential in terms uh, of those, the, those are like the, those are like the two big events, right? I mean, those are two the, very like big the events. Two big events, like well, those two, and I guess multicellular organisms, right? Those are like the three biggies in, in the in the movie of life, right? Those are big events, yes, but there there's others. And I always think of an underappreciated big event as just the oxygenation of the atmosphere by hmm. photosynthetic bacteria. And once, and we call them cyanobacteria, is one of the big groups that is capable of doing photosynthesis, a single-celled organism capable of doing photosynthesis. Um, you know, early on, when life first emerged, there was minimal oxygen, virtually no oxygen. And oxygen is a highly toxic environment. And so um, you know, the, the fact that um, there was, you know, life was young and there were many ways to make a living that had not yet been um, evolved, uh, being able to deal with oxygen uh, that was what mitochondria provided. They could metabolize oxygen, turn that into energy for um, multicellular organisms. This was a big deal. So even before chloroplasts and mitochondria was just oxygenating the environment. You know, currently we're roughly 20% oxygen, uh, give or take, in the environment. And, um, you know, early in life's evolution, it was virtually none. So that's also important. Well, so how does this endosymbiosis actually work? I mean, I think most people understand symbiosis, right? I mean, they understand cleaner fish, right? And the, right. the deal that they make with the with the um, the big fish, right? People understand, you know, the termites and, and the bacteria in, in their belly. And they even understand how we have all the, you know, bacteria in our orifices and on our skin and all that. And hopefully we'll talk about how important that mm -hmm. is. But this endosymbiosis i mean this is this is something that's categorically different i mean you you know you 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 swallow this thing and then you decide to integrate at the level of the uh, genetics how does that actually happen i mean how does that work yeah well um there could is you do a that lot of... you, i mean could, could have we done i mean i know we have crispr and so forth but have we actually been able to do something like that you know in in the in the lab yet? Yeah, I believe it has been. I believe it has been done in the lab. Um, and some of these are ephemeral. These would look like endosymbiotic events. And that's kind of, you know, um, it sort of proves the mechanism when we see that, well, here it is, it's starting and it goes on for a certain amount of time and a certain number of generations, but then it's lost. Um, and you would expect that. Um, but how it actually happens, you know, this is an active research area. And um, it is thought, in my reading of the literature is that often predation is involved. Um, so that's one mechanism by which you can get uh, one organism 
uh, forcing it to live inside another. Um, but there are so these are these are these are domesticated viruses, right? They're they're captured in the wild and 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 brought inside and bred in the barn, so to speak. You're talking about bacteria. Um, no, the I'm talking about the viruses, the endoviruses that uh, that give the that it, we, we're t- we're talking about. Um, so is but let's back up a second. So sure. maybe yeah. photosynthesis. And mitochondria, these are bacteria. Correct. Yeah. Right. And then we also have the endoviruses. Yeah, the we have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so these are essentially domesticated bacteria and domesticated viruses, right? One way to think about it. One way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That would be one way to think about it, that they are domesticated, that, um, you know, this was you know, not intentionally the way we've domesticated plants and animals, but, you know, that have uh, figured out a way to um, coexist and co-evolve with humans. Um, I will give one example of a, um, this is actually a horizontal gene transfer event, but it does involve of a viruses, a virus. And this is something that's been very important in the history of placental mammals like ourselves. And I talk about this in the book. And that is basically um, something we call HERVs in the human genome. And that's an acronym that stands for Human Endogenous Retrovirus. And we carry these, uh, a lot of copies of HERVs in our genome. They still have a reading frame, which means they're maintained intact. The only time that they're expressed is in growth of the placental tissue in females. And you can do a phylogenetic analysis on HERVs and see that these genes that have been carried um, by humans as long as humans have been around um, is actually a retrovirus gene. So an ancient infectious event between an early placental mammal, not humans per se, but a much older early placental mammal, um, gave rise to this capability for internal gestation as mediated through the placenta. And so it's fascinating because the placenta performs a function in, in some ways roughly analogous to what a retrovirus does is that it, uh, when it's a retrovirus is infecting a host, it has to find a way to signal to the immune system of the host, hey, don't kill me, I'm you. Even though mm-hmm. I'm not, it's a deception, but it's a way to um, sort of neutralize the effects of the immune system, which is always on surveillance, trying to kill antigens, foreign bodies. So a pregnancy, in some ways, it sounds a little strange, but it's an infection. And so the mother's immune system needs to be neutralized so it doesn't kill, eliminate the developing embryo. And so in development of the placenta, um, these herves maintain a function similar to what uh, the retroviruses do, from, and those are the retroviruses from which they're descended. So that's just an example of how um, uh, horizontal evolution is integrated even into our own past and that of other placental mammals, um, not marsupials, for example, or the monotremes. And, and so how, what percentage of, say, our uh, DNA would you say is built on some kind of merger and acquisition of a vet- virus or a bacteria? Yeah, a lot. Some of the figures with um, uh, viral sequences, particularly retroviruses that are present in very high copy numbers, I think it's over 50% of the human genome is um, derived from... Um, earlier infectious events. So it's a small proportion of our genome, which is really involved in, you know, encoding um, our bodies and our behaviors and our functions. Um, And so in in some ways it points to the notion that, you know, it's sort of a counter argument to that of intelligent design. Because if we were intelligently designed, would we have uh, so much retrovirus gene material that just laying around? Um, you know, it, um, it's expensive to maintain this stuff over time. It can be. Um, and so, you know, it sort of shows that we're not optimal. We, we are, we manage 
but were not optimally designed. Now, now of course, you also use this term holobiont, right? And that, that would mm -hmm. then expand the definition of the individual organism, right? To, to include all of the, the, the sort of symbiotic uh, bacteria that is being carried around. Are, are there any symbiotic uh, viruses that are also carried around that are not retroviruses? Um, well, that's a good question. There, you know, the, um, the holobiont includes the host and all of the, um, uh, all the microorganisms that are living on and inside the organism. And certainly Would there that are... include parasitical ones as well as yeah. uh, symbiotic yeah. ones? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And sim symbiosis doesn't uh, discriminate whether something is beneficial whether it's parasitic or otherwise, it's just a, a living together. And um, the, the partners may benefit differentially or not at all from the association. So it's sort of judgment neutral in terms of what these organisms are doing for or against each other. Um, but certainly, certainly there, are, um, there are viruses that, are, that evolve along with humans. Um, well, okay, so how does one then, I mean, if you wanted to make a distinction between, say, you know, parasite and symbiote, I mean, we do all the time, right? Because we're always trying to figure out, you know, what, what's the plant and what's the weed, right? You, you talk about Otzi, um, and, you know, he was carrying around, I guess, uh, a bunch of uh, whipworms in his system. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, he had intestinal worm infection, and um, he was carrying a string of polypore mushrooms, which are known to have to cause diarrhea. And so he was self-medicating, didn't know exactly why this worked, but um, uh, by having diarrhea induced, he was helping reduce the uh, load of his intestinal worms. Mm -hmm. Apparently, you know, why else was he carrying these carefully selected and dried uh, mushrooms on a string, which he kept in a pouch um, that that was uh, protected from the weather? Yeah. Well, so I guess so, it, I mean it is hard to it is hard to distinguish, right? So when you talk about the you know the helmets, right? I mean, they're parasites, but once you have adapted to them and your immune system presumably is stronger and they try to make it weaker, then at some point, if you remove them, then it becomes harmful. So that makes definition of uh, drawing the line very, very difficult, right? Yeah, because that um, there are some ways in which our, our defenses against some parasites, um, th they evolve together with the parasite. Then once the parasite is removed, um, we lose that immune system function which defended against that parasite and other things as well. And so um, it, is, it can be, this is one of the downsides of um, extreme hygienic uh, behaviors. This, this is thought to be the case. Now, you also walked through the history of this field. Is this line of research considered tangential for, for a long time? Where, where does it fit within the research paradigms today? Right. I talk about this section as um, the seeds of, you know, seeing horizontal evolution and its consequences hiding in plain sight, because some of the earliest observations and experiments demonstrating it were quite old, even from back to Darwin's time almost. And um, so uh, Schwendener, Simon Schwendener was a uh, German-Swiss botanist who was studying plants and lichens, and in the 18, uh, I think it was the 1860s or so, he first published some of his observations uh, looking through a microscope, relatively primitive microscope from the 1860s, and he spent a lot of his time on his dissertation work trying to improve microscopes, so he did a lot of work just as a, uh, a crafter of lenses trying to improve the quality. Um, but what he was seeing with lichens was it wasn't one organism. It seemed to be two organisms, mm -hmm. a fungal component and an algal component. And 
independently, they would do their own thing. But when they were combined, um, they would produce a phallus, which is sort of the leaf-like uh, structure of, of a lichen. And so once he convinced himself that this was real, um, he published and he presented his work at a conference and he was told that his, he had an overactive imagination and uh, his work was written off by the experts at the time. And one of the problems was it, it was in contradiction to what Darwin had talked about, where uh, a species differentiates um, because it gets into an, an area where its lifestyle changes and that becomes, can become a new species once there's some sort of a barrier to reproduction. So one thing becomes two. What Schwendener was talking about, two things becoming one. A fungal, uh, a fungal species and an algal species giving rise to a lichen. And so this was, you know, the, uh, Darwin's worldview was enough for people to uh, try to deal with at the time. <clears throat> and this just seemed to be, um, you know, out of sync with what Darwin was talking about as far as origins of species. And it was just sort of a special case here with lichens. Um, but the, the way it operated in Schwendener's case is um, there were some meetings and people agreed that if they could bring independently a fungus and an algal together, an algae together and get them to produce a, a lichen, then this, then he would be right. Uh, and people tried for a decade, couldn't do it. And then finally a group found the right sort of um, circumstances in the lab, the right conditions, and they could produce a lichen under these conditions. So um, this was known to be true, but it was always sort of off to the side. This wasn't enough to convince people that um, lineage joining could be a strong uh, part of evolutionary history. Andreas Schimper, he, he was looking at um, plant leaves through a microscope sometime after Schwendener, and he noticed that the, he coined the name chloroplastidin, uh, which we know now as chloroplast. He was speaking German as, you know, for the, uh, the photosynthetic organ. And he just noted in a footnote, hey, these things look a lot like photosynthetic bacteria. Maybe plants arose through an origin of a, an early plant form of some kind and a cyanobacteria, a chloroplast. But it was just in a footnote. And no one really picked up on it. And then he spent the rest of his career doing plant biogeography. And really, you know, there was, you know, people were limited by the methods and the general knowledge at the time. Um, and then um, Frederick Griffin, he was a uh, British microbiologist. And he was working with viruses in mice. And he noticed that one strain... Um, a non-virulent strain uh, of the um, of a, a strepto a strepto strep, streptococcus bacteria could be converted a, a non-virulent one could be converted to a virulent one in the lab, and this was weird because he had already killed the virulent one. He had no notion for why this happened. He just showed that it could be done, and he did it repeatedly, so it was clear. Uh, that there was a capability to, to transfer, to change uh, a non-virulent to a virulent form. And it was only years after his death that it was found out that this was due to horizontal gene transfer. So there was, those were, you know, three beginnings that um, we could see that there was extensive horizontal evolution. But in each case, it was just thought to be uh, sort of a small scale process and not a big deal in terms of evolution, which kind of supports a larger point uh, in the book, the whole need for a new uh, narrative, and that is because it's only relatively recently we've seen the great abundance of um, microbial life forms. You know, prior to 40, 50 years ago, we just didn't know about the great diversity of bacteria and archaea and, and even very small eukaryotes, as organisms like ourselves, um, but now we have more and more uh, whole genomes for all these organisms, and we're seeing the breadth of diversity in them. Um, and so we really have to rethink what are the major mechanisms of evolution for all of life, not just what we see in animals or animals and plants.
And this is why I think there's been some resistance to this idea that horizontal evolution really is highly consequential. It's just that we tend still to be human-centric and then animal-centric and then maybe animal and plant-centric. But if we really want to understand evolution of all of life, then we can see that uh, horizontal evolution is a big deal. You know, there's both still vertical and horizontal, but we can't neglect the horizontal evolution from the basic, the most basic narrative, especially for the public, if we want them to understand how evolution operates. Now, as an economist, I'm always thinking in terms of costs and benefits and, and trade-offs. Um, and so, you know, I can see the benefit of sort of endosymbiosis, right? Like we have, we need these gut bacteria to process food. And so we need to be sure to expose ourselves to it at birth and so forth. Um, and, you know, if we take too many antibiotics and stuff, then we kill them. So wouldn't it make more sense for us to just produce those characteristics, you know, stage a takeover of our gut bacteria, bake it into our DNA, problem solved? Um, <laughs> so wh why, why don't we do it? I mean, wh when does it make sense to actually keep these species separate? Um, well, I mean, um, like the placenta, presumably you could have a, sort of a, a, a virus which somehow helps you get pregnant, and, you know, and you just catch it, you know, when you're born, right? And, right, uh, and then right. it's passed on from gen. So why, 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 why would you bake it into the DNA and why not? Right. So the devil is in the details. And, you know, we are highly evolved systems, you know, any eukaryote humans and uh, primates and placental mammals in particular. And once you start messing with the sequence of developmental events, um, the potential for things to go wrong is high. And so it's, it's, we've learned, you know, through trial and error, it's difficult to intervene to do an intervention. And so we've tried, you know, delivering um, better copies of particular genes that are defective in that particular individual. And so many things can go wrong. Uh, you have to, you know, have to deliver the, um, the gene and it's say it's non mutant form in somebody who has a disease, you have to get into the right set of cells, uh, at the right time. And then there's a lot of downstream events. So it would be great if it were that simple. Um, and if we were dealing with just Legos or something, it would be easy. But biological systems are complicated. And that's why it, you know, that's why we see horizontal gene transfer so often in very simple organisms. Because there you can, you can change things uh, without, you know, they're less complicated. That's less they're more integrated. Mod they're more modular? So they more, yeah, they're, they're more, more like Lego bricks? They're more modular. There's just many fewer genes. It's a it's a simpler system to try to intervene in um, other organisms. It's it's very complex because it's hard to predict what the downstream events will be. Hmm. And also, a lot of you know, so many so many genes have multiple effects. We don't find you know a single gene, single effect. And so if you if you start wanting to seed with particular genes in an organism, it's much easier to disrupt things or to have unintended consequences um, because, you know, we're looking for a particular function from a gene, but in fact, a lot of genes have multiple functions. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's very hard to control, to look for a one-to-one -one aspect. Um, and this is one of the reasons why viruses are such great organisms, and I call them organisms, not, a, not all people would admit them as life forms, but why we use viruses as great model organisms, because the systems are relatively simple. And then we can, we can modify them and see what happens. Well, it seems like when biologists make great discoveries, th there were always people out in the practical world who had some inkling of it, right? So when you talk about um, hybridization, I mean, people who have been growing you know, fruit right, for a long, they've been doing this hybridization for, for a long time. Some of the fruits right. that we see on the shelves are a product of, of, of hybridization. Right. I mean, right. how much, right. how right. much, how much does the practice of engaging in the organic world influence what, what 
biologists think about and how they do their research? I think it influences it a great deal. Um, certainly, humans have been hybridizing um, different plant species for tens of thousands of years, you know, before we understood the mechanisms, maybe, you know, before we understood the mechanisms of what was going on, it was just sort of trial and error and sort of, and a basic understanding that um, like begets like. And so, you know, we take this particular organism, the, the, these fruits are larger and tastier, and these are the ones we want to breed more of. So we select their seeds and carry them on. Um, we don't necessarily, you know, early on, people didn't know why that happened. They just knew that it did happen. And similar for hybridization, you could mix um, different different types of organisms, like, like Darwin was a, a pigeon fancier. And so he knew about hybridization from different types of pigeons. They were interfertile. So, you know, if you're using reproductive isolation as a way to identify species, it would all be one species, but there were very distinct forms that pigeon fanciers knew about. And so Darwin, you know, he was well aware of a lot of um, crossing or hybridization amongst different kinds of pigeons and getting different characteristics and breeding for certain things. And so was Gregor Mendel was a, he was doing hybrids and in the first iterations of his book um, written in the late 1700s, you know, he, he was a deist, he was a creationist. He thought that there, all the species were, were f fully formed a creation. But he convinced himself uh, begrudgingly that, hey, new species could come about in the garden by hybridizing some of his plant species. And then latter editions of his work, he gave some of the, some of the hybrids that were created names. Um, so he was beginning to see that, yeah, there were new forms could arise. So it's, it's a very long history for, for hybridization that's gone on. And I, and I talk about in the book, we're not done at all with uh, these sorts of experiments. Humans will be doing more and more forms of uh, hybridizations or tinkering with life forms. Um, you know, if we can find some that carry particular functions that humans are interested in and talk briefly about, you know, um, bacteria that have the ability to remediate environmental toxins. This is something most everybody agrees could be a good thing. Uh, or bacteria that are capable of um, producing energy. Um, and so, you know, I talk about that we will eventually be using horizontal evolution to our benefit. You know, the question is, can we do it wisely enough? But we are mimicking uh, horizontal gene transfer and, and hybridization through, meaning recombination for microbial forms. And we are using these things to help us make it into the future so that all of the things we're learning about horizontal evolution, many of them will have applications for medicine, for public health, for agriculture. Um, so this is well worth doing and well worth having the, the general public understand um, the value of biological diversity because we may be able to use what those organisms have been selected for to do in the wild. This is, you know, a, a tinkerer would keep these bits of uh, capability for what we can do down, down the line in terms of uh, tinkering with, with life forms, which of course gets to be an ethical issue and a, a larger question. Well, I mean, this type of gene editing is categorically different from selective breeding, right? So, you know, selective breeding, you would create a huge amount of variety. I think a lot of times now they use radiation to stimulate a whole bunch of mutations and then go find the ones that look promising. Mm -hmm. But this is a way of short-circuiting that, right? By grabbing features that you like and sort of inserting them, you know, into the the genome of the of the species you're trying to modify but i mean there's also a categorical difference between the kind of editing that affects the germ cells right right so you know we know right. if you if you if you give somebody a biotic arm their kids don't inherit the biotic arm and there's a lot of i think genetic 
therapies out there that also don't impact the the offspring, right? So the sickle cell um, intervention, I think, that is now gaining some steam. I mean, that is something presumably that every generation would have to undergo the same form of gene therapy, right? Mm -hmm. um, are we going to move to a phase where we will be able to do some kind of self induced Lamarckian style evolution through gene editing? <laughs> uh, I think the potential is there. Um, and you know, the, the, the possibility of doing gene editing, as you say, in the, in the, um, sex cells, the sperm or eggs also called the gametes. This is where, um, things get really dicey in terms of the ethics of it. And I mean, do we, uh, you know, and I think increasingly it's, it's going to become a big issue because our, we have the capability to do some of these things. And it was even tried by one um, Chinese scientist who was yeah. editing um, embryos um, so that they couldn't get HIV. But this, you know, um, this was very early on. Um, so potentially, you know, you could affect, um, you could take traits like height and uh, physical strength or intelligence, and there could be editing um, in gene cells to try to promote, promote these features, um, which sounds good, but then who, who gets it, who, who benefits from this, and who doesn't, um, and how does it all, you know, where is it going? Um, and also, what what are some of the repercussions of doing that? As I was saying before, there's lots of unintended consequences that happen once you start messing around with something as complicated as a genome. But I, you know, it's possible, and I think eventually these things will happen. Is just my guess. Well, I mean, I think the idea of infecting someone with a uh, virus to protect them from a virus who's a pretty scary idea at, at one point, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and that was done even before people knew what they were doing by grinding up right. scabs and um, inhaling them as a way to provide some immunity from the virus that caused the scab, the scabbing. Well, I mean, we are a product of hybridization. I mean, we, we've interbred with most recently Neanderthals and the Homo florensis, but I think in, if you go back even further, there's lots and lots of kind of mixing and matching of all these humanoid species, right? Yes, our, our history is highly reticulate. There's lots of interbreeding, and this is the you know the results of um, really a great deal of exciting research into um, the genetics of hominins, and you know using current extant human. Um, genomes, as well as genomes isolated from uh, subfossils, from bone materials left behind by uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, and other life forms. We see that there's a lot of, there was a lot of interbreeding, which we could say hybridization, whether you call them, whether you call Neanderthals a different species from ours or not, um, is, it's a bit academic and the same with Denisovans. Um, but there's just a lot of reticulate, a lot of reticulate evolution amongst these populations or species, whichever you'd like to call them. Well, if if we were to start doing more of this human directed horizontal evolution, um, I'm betting we would start it somewhere other than on humans. Um, and you talked a bit about using this these tools to eliminate, say, mosquitoes, right? or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some other pathogen that we don't like. Um, what are some, do you think those will be tools that will become more widespread? And, and then, and then what would be next after that? Would we then say, Hey, we want our livestock to have certain features. And if we were to go in that direction, would it be primarily around stitching in sort of symbiotic characteristics or would it be stitching in features from other species that look look interesting and attractive you know lactose tolerance for uh mm -hmm. for for other people and so forth how would we do what do you think are some of the promising avenues for 
application of this? Um, well, um, I, I think, you know, one area we could talk, be talked about is longevity and that, you know, human lifespans are increasing and have been increasing largely as a benefit of our, uh, of better hygiene and understanding how to treat certain diseases so that now a lot more people are living long enough to die of the diseases of old age, uh, like heart disease and cancer. Um, but I, th I suppose that as we, we learn more about the process of senescence, it really seems to be a trade-off between DNA damage and DNA repair during the lifetime of an individual. And eventually, everybody so far, um, the damage side catches up with you and the, uh, the damage outweighs the capacity, uh, our amazing capacity to repair DNAs. Um, but eventually we succumb. And, you know, I think that that's one avenue where there'll be a lot of research on what the, the molecular mechanisms by which DNA damage happens and by which DNA repair happens and trying to promote better repair and less damage could affect longer lifespans. So that's, that's one that's a very active area of research. And the other questions, it's, it's fascinating, but it's just hard to predict. So in other words, there might be some bit of genetic code that the Greenland sharks have and that the tortoises have that promotes repair, and we could identify it <laughs> and, and splice it in somehow. And, and then possibly. pass it on to our offspring. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, David, thanks so much for joining me. These, these are all wonderful uh, concepts. I, I, I love the uh, the re re the new narrative around, around evolution. It definitely makes you rethink all of these new developments. And um, uh, hope, thanks for joining me. Hope to talk to you again soon. And the book here is called The Network of Life, A New View of Evolution. Talk again soon. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Take care. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.